Angesichts der Vorstellung seines zweiten Buches hatte ich das Vergnügen, mit dem Verhaltensökonomen Dan Ariely vom MIT zu sprechen. Wir sprachen unter anderem über Verhaltensökonomie, natürlich, aber auch über Banker und Ratten. First of all, let me just say a word about behavioral economics. Yeah. No, so, um, behavioral economics is, is really um, kind of a combination of lots of social science that is empirically in nature. And it's kind of attacking economics um, for two reasons. One, because economics has become so uh, big part of our lives in terms of decision-making, businesses and policy, that it's good to realize where economic fails. And where reality starts. But, but the second thing that is more important is that it's a, it's a study that kind of shows us how our intuitions fail. And I think we often have this, uh, this great gut feeling about what's the right, the right thing to do. And it turns out our gut feelings are just gut feelings. They're often not, not correct. And it's really good to keep in mind how often it is that we're failing and to think about how we test our intuitions more, more generally. And The question about bankers is one, is one example for this. So, you know, in this country, like in the US, uh, bankers are getting paid lots of money. Uh, they're getting paid much of it in bonuses. And at the end of the day, uh, it's the shareholders of the company who are paying their salaries. So it's not as if it's their own money, you know, which they can pay themselves as much as they want. It's, it's shareholders' money. And the question is, is this an efficient way to pay people? And there's lots of reasons to give people bonuses, but one of them is to the idea that if you make people really want to achieve something, they'll be successful. And the question is, is this, is this the case? And it turns out it's partially the case. It turns out that as long as we deal with simple mechanical things, more money means better performance. Mm -hmm. So imagine I asked you to jump, and I gave you a jumping bonus of either one euro per jump, or a thousand euro per jump. You will jump more as the bonus gets, gets higher. And people predict that, and that's indeed the case. But what happens when the tasks require thought, and memory, and creativity, and concentration, all of those highly cognitive skills? It turns out that here too, people think that more bonuses will yield higher performance, but here the results are actually opposite. And that's the case when we actually behave much like rats. And, and the idea is that incentives or money is a two-edged sword. It makes us want to perform very well, but it also stresses us. And sometimes the stress can overwhelm performance. So, for example, if I told you that if you'll be funny in the next 10 minutes, really, really funny, I'll give you 10,000 euros, how much of your next 10 minutes would you be able to think about all the jokes you know and what's the funniest of them uh, compared to how much stressed uh, you, you would be. And it turns out that very easily st stress overwhelms it. Another way to think about it is imagine your job and imagine there was like a hundred percent motivation. And even without bonus you have a high motivation, right? You can think to yourself how much are you on this from a hundred percent. And now the end of the motivation, what's missing, you could say you could make up with a bonus could get you to do percent but but if the bonus overshoots and become too big now you'll start thinking about it all the time you'll be wondering am i making my bonus is this good enough is this and as a consequence you're not going to to perform as well and 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 you know in the last kind of a couple of years i've been going to lots of bankers and talking to them <laughs> about this and, 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 and uh, sorry and they did listen to you <laughs> They listen, but they don't, they don't agree with me, right? Because, you know, they get paid so much money not to agree. But so bankers say, we know, we never get stress. You have no money in the world that would stress us. And <clears throat> it's hard to say. I mean, I'm inviting them to come to the lab and being tested. They, they, never, they never show up. But, but they all agree to the following. They all say that for the last three or four months of the year, every day, They go to their desk, they open an Excel spreadsheet, and they calculate how much bonus they will make this year. So if nothing else, even if not stressed, they agree that they spend lots of time on it. Because imagine that you could get paid lots and lots of money, and 80% of it was unknown, 80% of it was in a bonus. Wouldn't you be occupied a big part of the day, every day, with this thought about, you know, will you make this big pot of money Or not. It's kind of interesting, right, that we want people to go to a particular goal 
and we give them lots of money. We say, naturally, you're not going to do it, so we'll give you lots of money. But what the money does is to make you think about the money <laughs> and not necessarily the, the, end, the end goal. So it's a really strange idea about incentive if you think about it. Don't they get used to that high numbers? And this is their reasoning, is it? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, first of all, it's not clear that they get used to it, you know. Um, now, people get used to stuff at the end of the day, uh, but how much, how much time will you need to get used to stuff? It's not clear that a yearly bonus for 10 or 20 years is a lot of repeated, experiment, repeated experience, because the fact is, they still seem to be consumed by it every year. And, and in some way, I think societies make it worse. Because we tell bankers that the only thing we value about them is how much money they get. And we make lists in the newspaper that says how much money they get. And they compare it with their friends. So they become obsessed about it beyond the financial aspect. So even people who might be sufficiently wealthy and don't have to worry about it still worry about it because we as a society have put so much value on this as a measure of their self-worth. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's you can think of it as actually a big, big part of this book is is the idea that if we if we wrote an equation of what predicts motivation, like you have a y variable that what predicts motivation, then you have lots of x variables, and one of them would be salary and bonus and meaning and all kinds of other variables. The question is, what are all these variables that are are in this equation? And I think for bankers, one of the things we've done is we've taken lots of those other variables and replaced them with money. Okay. So, you know, you can think about where do you find meaning at work? What do you mm -hmm. find satisfying? Right? It could be maybe about creating an interesting website or coming up with something clever, or having your name associated with something that people... There's lots of other things that you value. For bankers, we've replaced all of those with money. So, so in some sense, we are making it worse. Okay, and where do the rats come in? Okay, so this is one of the, the earliest experiments in, in psychology over 100 years old in which they took a couple of rats and they measure what is the relationship between the amount of electrical shock that they get, which is an incentive. Actually, the incentive is to avoid electrical shock. Okay. <laughs> and how fast the rats were learning. So imagine you're a rat, you're in a maze, and some areas of the maze are safe and some are dangerous. And every day you need to figure out which one are safe and which one are dangerous. And there are different hints in the environment. One day the safe could be white and dangerous can be black. One day it could be a different color, stripes, all kinds of things like it. And you have to figure it out. And now the question is, how will your speed of learning be a function of the electrical shock? Mm -hmm. Now, when the electrical shock is very mild, you don't care. Learning is very slow. As the electrical shock gets bigger, you want to learn faster and you learn faster and faster and faster. But at some point, the shock becomes so strong that it actually reverses. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can think about it. Imagine you were walking in Berlin. Imagine you didn't know the city. And imagine that some areas were safe and some were dangerous and you were getting electrical shock, depending mm -hmm. on it. You can imagine that at some point, the electrical shock will be so powerful, it will just take your breath away. Mm -hmm. That from time to time, you'd make a wrong turn and you just kind of get this amazing shock. And, Under those conditions and this level of fear, would you be able to focus or would be totally consumed mm -hmm. with the shock? And the same thing happens to bankers when they become totally consumed with the financial reward. They just think about that. They don't think about their own performance actually as much. Behavioral economics is not that straight. It's kind of fuzzy. Yes. And there's way too much fun in it to be a serious science. So what, does your, what do your classical colleagues Think about behavioral economics. Yeah, so first of all, let me tell you what I think about them. <laughs> um, look, the reality is that I like standard economics. I think it's a beautiful, elegant, interesting theories with some prediction power. Right? So if you look at economics, you wouldn't say it's 100% wrong, right? It's yeah. X percent right. How much is the X percent? Is it 20%, 30%? I mean, you, you can decide for yourself how much you think it's right. And, And I think the cardinal sin of economics is not that economics is wrong, but that, the, but that economists have pretended it's more right than it really is. Mm -hmm. right? so, so think about what the message is from economics when you read the introduction to economics. 
It says, here's a theory. It explains human behavior. It explains perfectly human behavior. And you don't need anything else. And you can take this theory and you can build public policy and you can build companies and you can build regulation. You can build markets <laughs> based on that. And that, I think, is the problem. Mm. And when you talk to people who have PhDs in economics and have studied for a long time and are not in the University of Chicago, they all realize that economics is much more restrictive than that. It doesn't explain 100% of the variance, it explains some of the variance. But the problem is that it's so tempting to say, here's a theory that explains some things, let's not assume it explains more. Um, that, I think, is the, big, is the big problem. Now, what, what do economists think about uh, behavioral eco economics. Um, so I think that first of all they are uh, uncomfortable with the type of uh, messiness of behavioral theory. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you think about it, um, one of the main criticisms is that there's not a single theory of behavioral economics. Behavioral economics right now it's a, it's a set of things we don't do well. And they're not all connected into one, mm -hmm. one big theory. And economists kind of are upset with that because there's not a single theory. It's hard to figure out where things, where things are. And in some th sense, I think they're right. It's a shame we don't have a single theory. But I don't think we ever will have a single theory. Here's my hope. I think that economic, economics should stay economics. Right? I think that the last two chapters of every introductional textbook should include some behavioral economics. But... Economies should keep on doing what economists are doing. Mm -hmm. They're contributing, it's providing interesting theory and insight and analysis. They should, they should keep on doing what they're doing. Where things should change, I think, have to do with when we come to implement something in the real world. So if you're going to, as a company or as an individual or as a, as a government, you're going to implement something, now I want you to be more careful. Because theory could be theory, fun theory for its own sake, and it's an interesting intellectual pursuit. But when it comes to implementing something in the world, now I want you to be more cautious. I want to say how much of it should be explained by economics and how much of it should be explained by psychology and sociology and philosophy. And maybe instead of implementing something based on our gut intuition, we do an experiment that tests which one of these two forces are more relevant in this, in this particular case. So, for example, imagine that we're going to try and create a new educational policy. Yeah. Right? And we want to incentivize the teachers and the principal and the students. How should we incentivize them? Economics has a very simple answer for this. Pay them. <laughs> Psychology has a more complex answer for this, which says that sometimes you can pay people and the result can actually backfire. Sociology will probably have a different answer. And before you go and implement something that would cost, you know, millions of euros, Maybe it's good to kind of stop and think and say, here's some inputs from psychology, from sociology, from economics. Let's do a couple of studies in trying to figure out which one of those seems to be the best, mm -hmm. the best combination. This would be rational. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be rational in, in, the, in the formal sense, because remember that in, in, in principle, we're supposed to know all these answers, <laughs> right? This is basically saying we don't know. We're just going to admit how much we don't know, and we're going to try it out. Um, there's one typical thing about behavioral economics that makes it, for me as a consumer, very much fun. It's often counterintuitive. So um, what I learned in your book is that commercial ads in the TV um, make my life happier. Yes. Really? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very surprising, but it does. You know, by the way, I think that um, this is the most interesting thing is how often our intuitions are wrong. Mm -hmm. It's really quite, quite amazing when you think about it. And, and maybe the biggest uh, irrationality of them all is the fact that we don't seem to recognize how irrational we really are and how much our behavior is not driven by what we think is driving it. So, so think about this issue of adaptation. <clears throat> Imagine you have a fun experience, something fun like a massage. And I'm asking you, would it be better if you took breaks in the middle? And people mostly say, no, it's so much fun, why would I take breaks? 
Now let's think about something not fun. You're doing your taxes. Is it, is it good to take breaks in the middle? And people say, yes, of course I want to take breaks. And it turns out that the breaks are consistent with what people believe. So if you have something fun and you take a break, the break is unpleasant. Mm -hmm. If you make something that is not fun and you take a break, the break is pleasant. But what people fail to understand is that when they go back to the experience, the experience will be different than the one they have left. So here's what happened. You start a massage and the massage is fun. And over time the massage becomes less and less and less fun. Mm -hmm. You start something unpleasant like doing your taxes and over time it becomes slightly less annoying. You get used to it. This mm -hmm. is what adaptation is about. Now, this is the natural progression if you keep on being there. But what happens if you stop and take a break? If you have a massage and it's becoming worse, not as good, and then you take a break, when you get back to it, it's not where you left it, it's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And then you go down a little bit, and you take a break, and you come back, it's a little bit better. And the same thing with negative events. Something starts negative, becomes better, you take a break, get back to it, it's really miserable. Right? So, so what happened is that we have this incredible ability to adapt, which is both good and bad. It's good that we get used to bad stuff, it's not as good that we get used to, to good stuff. Um, but, but what happens is that when we take breaks, those breaks reduce adaptation. They slow down the adaptation process. Mm -hmm. So when we have something good, we want to slow down adaptation. When we have something bad, we don't want to slow down adaptation. So the advice is, when something good is happening, take breaks, <laughs> which is very counterintuitive. You watch a movie, take, uh, take a break. Uh, you're having a wonderful meal, take a break. Uh, you can you can think for yourself whether if you have uh, sex with your significant other whether it's worthwhile <laughs> to take a break in the middle or not. But but on the other hand, if you do something um, that is not good that you're not really enjoying, it's best to just focus and and finish it and not take these breaks. That's not tempting. Counterintuitive. <laughs> Another thing I stumbled over and was very fascinated with: what is it about self hurting? <laughs> yeah. Um, here, here is the basic idea. Imagine that there are two ways for us to make a decision. We can consult our preferences, saying what do I like, what do I don't like, or we can rely on our memory and say what did I do before. It turns out in many cases relying on what we've done before is an easier path because what we've done before is very salient for us mm -hmm. while computing our preferences is hard. So think about something like a glass of water. How much is this worth for you? How much, how much would you pay for it? Very hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. Is it worth, you know, a euro, euro 50, 50 cents? Really hard to figure out. How thirsty am I? That's right. And, and how much is this a pleasure that it will give to you? Um, but what you can do is you can rely on your memory and say, last time I paid X for it, more or less. <clears throat> Now, because of this, What we often do is we often rely on our memory rather than our preferences. Mm -hmm. So here is, here is the idea. Uh, imagine that you go to a new country and they have a new currency and you don't know much about what's going on and there's a new fruit you've never tasted before. And you end up, you end up paying whatever, a thousand currency units for that particular fruit. The next time you come to think about that fruit, what do you know? Do you know how much pleasure you derive from it? Do you know what's your opportunity cost? What else you're giving up? Very hard to think about. But you say, I remember what I paid last time. I remember last time I paid a thousand units, whatever it is. And you say, I always make the right decision. Last time was no exception. I must have made the right decision. Okay. Let me repeat that. And that basically creates a situation in which you can behave once in a certain way And because you remember your behavior, you can keep on behaving in the same way over and over and over, even though the initial decision was not necessarily ideal for you. Okay, I bought an expensive car, so I buy another one. Yes. Now, with expensive cars, there's multiple things that happen. You buy an expensive car, you get used to driving expensive cars. But beyond that, you don't go back and say, let me look at the whole range of cars and think about how should I spend my money. Mm. You say, I bought an expensive car last time, 
must have made sense. I'm in similar situation to what I was before. Let me keep on doing the same decision. And this is all subconscious, unconscious. So, yeah, so you know, subconscious, unconscious. These are, these are tough distinctions mm -hmm. uh, to make because um, the, the kind of conditions under which we call some something, uh, it, it could be, is it aware, is it unaware, is it deliberative? I mean, there's lots of different terms. What, what, I'm, what I'm comfortable saying is that it's not a highly deliberative process. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you necessarily tell to yourself, I did this before, let me do this, do this again. It, it, there is something habitual about it. Mm -hmm.